The following podcast is brought to you by the Bridge Bible Church. For more information, please visit us online at thebridgewire.com. Good morning, church. If my voice holds out, that would be a blessing. Uh, we, we've had a, a good week. It, as some of you know, I've been helping at the high school with the wrestling team, and we had matches Thursday, and then we had a big tournament this weekend. And so I, I reverted to like a 20-year-old crazy wild man yelling from the sidelines. You know, I was like, where did that come from? I don't know, but m- my voice went with it. And so, uh, yeah, so I'm just praying that as we finish up our Ephesians series today, my voice holds out and uh, that we'll get through it well. But uh, we've come to the end. It's, it's, it seems hard to, to realize we've come to the end of this time going through the book of Ephesians, and we just looked how God has this lavish grace on his people through Christ Jesus in various ways. And, and so when we get to the end, there's this sense where Paul says, I, I want to wrap it up, and I want to do that by telling you to go forth and engage, to be a part of what God is really doing. And many of you who know this passage, this is talking about this, putting on the spiritual armor of God. But there was a bumper sticker uh, that I saw when I was growing up, and I saw it all over South Carolina. I don't know if it was up here, but there was this big uh, uh, push for education and stuff a while back in the 80s and 90s and stuff. But this bumper sticker appeared, and it had the little teacher's apple in that, and it says, you know what's right, do it. And that's what Paul's saying here. We have just gone through this epistle this letter to the church at Ephesus. And he says, we've talked about how God transforms us through Jesus Christ and all the blessings that come with that and all the grace that he's lavished on us. And we talked about how life is supposed to look. He says, now that we know what life should look like, let's go forth and do it. But in order for us to do it, I need to give you a few more things to think on. And so we come to Ephesians chapter 6. We come to 10. And Paul is saying, this is where we need to go. This finally, it's where it starts. Ephesians 6, 10, it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. This finally is a continuation. So a lot of times this passage kind of gets pulled out of context and people just look at it and say, yeah, we need to put on the armor of God. And they look at this passage for this, just this significance of the armor of God. But Paul is making a a, a big overarching statement here. He says, in light of all of these things that we've talked about, church, in light of all the ways Christ has lavished grace upon us and called us forth into, into life and to have fullness of life, finally, you need to be aware of this. You need to put on the armor of God. So he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He tells us to be strong in the Lord. Now, I think being American sometimes can hurt our Christianity. And what I mean by that is that there's this self-confident, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, I can do it, just put myself into it, kind of, this is the mentality that we kind of have in our culture, right? And he says, don't approach your new life in Christ with this mentality that, okay, Jesus saved me, now I got it from here. He says, no, be strong in the Lord, in his strength. We don't do this in our own strength. We don't do this in, our, in ourselves. We are doing this walking with God. So he says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. So we have to, we have to recognize there's a dependency here. Church, there's a dependency on Christ in all things. We depend on him not just for our salvation, but for all all of life and godliness. And so he says, be strong in him and in the strength of his might. Our strength is in the union with Christ. So we have to recognize. And so in verse 11, he goes on. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So be strong in the Lord and put on his armor. Not your armor. Not your cunningness, not your wisdom, not your strength, not your glory. Put on the Lord's armor. Put on what he has provided for you. Listen, if God has something that he is providing for you, 
it would be foolish not to take it. I mean, he holds it out and says, here's the armor. We're about to go into battle. Now you can go in with what you have, or you can go in with what I have for you. If God holds out a precious gift as the armor of God, we should take it, and we should put it on. And so he says, he says, put on the whole armor of God. This is the armor that will cover us. It will protect us. It defends us. It makes it possible to stand. He says that you will be able to stand. If you want to be a successful Christian, so to speak, if you want to be one who is victorious in your Christian life, then this is part of the process. You put on the armor of God so you are able to stand. So we're in the areas that we'll look at, when you don't have it equipped, you're vulnerable. You're able to be attacked by the world, by the flesh, by sin, by Satan. You're vulnerable. He says, if you want to be able to be victorious, to have the full victory and the fullness of life that's offered in Christ Jesus, you put on the armor of God. And so this makes it possible to stand. It guards us against Satan. Notice here, he says that you'll be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He's crafty. He's evil. He's wicked. Satan, he knows humanity. He knows how to attack us. And he doesn't like us very much. Look at a couple of passages here. 1 Peter 5.8. It says this. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So not only is he scheming, he's hungry. He's hungry to devour you. If there is a lion roaming about, uncaged, you don't just nonchalantly walk around it. You don't just be, oh, look, there's a lion. How, how neat. You, know, you don't do that. I mean, how many of you guys have watched those National Geographic things? You know, and, and I'm sure right now everybody in their head that just heard that. Dun, 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 dun. Did you just hear that? Like in your head I said that? And like you saw the cheetah like running across the field. Yeah. So imagine being out on the savannah with a roaring lion, a prowling lion, hungry. And you're the dinner. <laughs> you're it. He, not only is this lion hungry, he's scheming. He's smart. Look at what Jesus says to Peter in Luke twenty-two thirty-one. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. If Satan will ask God to sift Peter, do you think he's going to think twice to ask God to sift you? Or me? No. He'll gladly do it. He will come before God accusing us over and over again just as he came before God with Job. Job, a righteous man. And Satan comes before God and says, he only loves you because you take care of him, you provide for him, you've blessed him. Take all that stuff away, he'll curse you. He asked to sift Job like we. He asked to sift Peter like we. He will ask to sift you and I like we. He's scheming. He's evil. He's cunning. He would love a foothold. He would love a foothold into our lives. And so Paul says we have to put on this armor so there is no foothold. So he doesn't have an avenue of entrance. That He doesn't have a way to get in. He would love nothing more than to tempt us, to, to be speaking falsehood, to have uncontrolled anger, to steal or share unwholesome talk. These are all ideas that have come out of this letter. He would love to have those things in our lives. He would love to tempt us in those areas, to make us stumble. He will entice the Christian. You don't, you don't get rats with just poison. If you ever look on the back of those, and I know you've probably heard this illustration, but if you look on the back of uh, a box of rat poison or mouse poison, the vast majority of that is good food. The vast majority is enticing. It smells good to the, 
to the rodent. It looks good to them. They, they want to eat it. It's enticing to them. But it's just that little bit of poison that kills them. Satan's the same way. He's going to entice the Christian that the former ways of life were better than walking with Christ. He's going to bring up those remembrances of, man, remember how you used to run with the boys? Man, that was fun, wasn't it? Remember how all you guys used to do this? Or, oh, remember how this used to be? He's going to bring back those things that the flesh is going to say, oh, yeah, I remember that. And he's going to entice you. He's going to look for ways to get back in. He's going to look for ways to bring you back to the flesh and back to sin. He wants it to look desirable. Ultimately, he dis distorts the truth. He camouflages evil. The definition of truth is what reflects reality. So what does Satan do? He distorts reality. He wants to camouflage it. He wants to scheme in such a way that what is real is not seen. And that's what Paul's talking about here to the Ephesians. He says, what is real is this union with Christ, is this salvation and this grace given to us through Christ. This is real. Real life is found back with God, being joined back with him. But Satan says, no, 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 that's not real life. Real life is, oh, this here, this is fun. This feels fulfilling. This thing that you had, this is really good. And he distorts and he schemes and he plots to camouflage evil to pull us away. Well, let's look at Ephesians 6.12 now. Paul goes on. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. I enjoyed going through this because being in wrestling now, I was like, oh, it actually has wrestling in my passage. This is really cool. You know? And so I've enjoyed just kind of diving in here and looking at that. And I look back at you know, in the Old Testament where Jacob wrestles all night. And you know, so I just enjoyed, that was like a little side thing for me this week. I just enjoyed being there and, and looking at it. But I was thinking, we're wrestling, but he says, not against flesh and blood. And then you're thinking, well, Paul, what are you talking about, man? Because like you've been persecuted, you've been beaten senselessly, almost to death. You've been stoned and drug out of a city left for dead. You've been shipwrecked. You've been persecuted. Now you're in chains in jail, and you're saying, oh, we don't battle against flesh and blood. Paul's not diminishing what you and I are walking through. He, he recognizes that there's a battle happening in the day-to-day. -day. He's not oblivious to it. I mean, he knows probably better than most of us that there's a battle that is happening in the day-to-day. -day. But he knows that there is a battle beyond this battle. There's a battle being waged in the heavenlies. And he says, this is the one that we really need to be aware of. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against these rulers and these powers and these authorities, this present darkness. So he says we're wrestling here. He uses this illustration of a sport. It's the only time he uses it. Um, and he uses wrestling, and this is how it's defined. And I think it's, it's very apropos as to why he uses it. Wrestling is defined this way. A close, intense battle filled with manipulation and strategy. I love that definition. I mean, just reflecting on watching the boys out there this weekend wrestling. It was a battle. I mean, they went out there and they were just going head to head, close, intense, trying to set guys up to make that false move so they can swoop in the other way and get a lag and take them down. I mean, it was exciting to watch and to see the strategy of that sport. And he says, you know what? We're wrestling in the spiritual battle. It's this close, intense battle. It's, it's real. It's not something that you just nonchalantly go into. He says, it is happening. And this is what it looks like. It's like a wrestling match. You know what? Early in the season, you know who usually wins the wrestling matches early in the season? It's not always the best wrestler. When I say the best wrestler, I mean the guy who knows all the moves and it's kind of seasoned. It's usually the guy who's better conditioned and has more spirit and heart at the beginning. The guy who's been working hard. 
the guy who's put in the time at the beginning to get himself back into shape and to get himself ready. You know, cause sometimes there's this sense where the, the guy who's seasoned kind of hits a lull. He's like, yeah, I got this. I'm pretty good. I know how to wrestle. I, you know what? I had a great year last year. I think I can just walk on to the mat in the first few matches. You know, it's not going to be that hard. I'll just pick up where I left off. That's not the case. They, they get lulled into this sense of security, and the guy who's really been working comes out, and he's able to take advantage of the guy who's actually the better wrestler and beat him. Listen, Paul's saying if it's like a wrestling match, you and I have got to be conditioned spiritually. And part of that conditioning is being walking with Christ and having his armor on and, and being aware and not letting our guard down. It's an intense battle. And so here we are wrestling with these rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces. Now there's a few ways that this is sometimes looked at. Sometimes it's looked at those groups as being referring to social or societal systems. And it can be. It can be some of that. What we see in the here and now. The things that we actually experience in our culture. But I believe what Paul is talking about here are these powers that are working in tandem with the evil one. I believe he's really talking about spiritual forces. And so this is why uh, we look at something in the Old Testament like 2 Kings chapter 6. And now this is Elisha. And he's in the city of Dothan. And Israel's going to war with Syria. And the, every time the Syrian king makes a move, right, in, in this battle, he's strategic. He's, he's planning it out. He's like, I'm going to make this move. We'll get Israel here. And every time he makes a move, Elisha hears from the Lord, sends a message to the king of Israel and says, uh, don't go there. It's a trap. Oh, don't be in this place. His army's stationed there. Make sure you go this way so you're, you're safe. And every time he, Israel gets away, so much so that the king of Syria says, who's against me? Who's the traitor? There's somebody in the midst here that keeps telling Israel what's going on before we do it. And they say, oh, king, it's not us. But there's this guy, Elisha. And, and God speaks to Elisha. And he tells him everything that's even spoken in your private bedchamber. He says, well, where is this guy? Well, he's in Dothan. He's like, let's go get him. So he wages siege on one city for one man. And this is what we see. So Syrian's army shows up. And it says, and when the servant of the man of God, so this is when the servant of Elisha rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is what Paul's talking about. Here's the spiritual battle. It's real. We look at the Old Testament passage. It's real. And Paul says it's still happening today. And he says here, we have to have eyes that behold and see. And we have to be prepared for the wrestling, for the war, for the battle against these spiritual powers that are working. But like Elisha, we can say, oh, greater is the one with us. We're just going to withstand why? Because the victory's won. Christ has already disarmed Satan. Christ has already defeated him at the cross. And like a wounded soldier, any of you seen The Last Samurai? I'm a movie guy. I like movies. Anybody see The Last Samurai? Okay, a few of you. In The Last Samurai, the samurai are fighting in Japan to take back the old ways against the new ways. And the new ways have army now with weapons and guns. And so they're fighting against the, the army, and it's really a lost cause because they don't have the ability to overtake. And so these samurai soldiers, many of them are wounded, and they're going to die. The wounds are fatal wounds, but they keep fighting. In fact, you watch the scenes, and when they get wounded, 
and they know they're about to die, they fight with more veracity. They're, they're, they're fighting with everything they have left because they know it's a very, very short time. That's Satan. He knows his time is limited. It's a very, very short time. The death blow has already been struck, and he is dying. And he is fighting with more tenacity and veracity and cunning and evil and hate and spite than ever before because he knows that one day the sky will part, the clouds will be rolled back, and the Son of Man will return, and it will be done. And so he is fighting, and Paul says, we have to withstand. We just stand. We put on the armor, and we stand. We don't have to worry, because the victory is won. We can withstand him. Now, I don't want us to miss the corporate component, because he's talking about us putting on the armor, but he's saying we as a church, we put on the armor. We do it together. We have to recognize what's going on. So we talk about Tuesday night prayer meeting. Corporately, we come together to stand. We come together to put on the armor of God together, to stand shoulder to shoulder, to be praying for one another, be praying for our church and our community, and to be pressing back against the present darkness. We pray together to do battle in the heavenlies. It's an important night. If you can make it, make it. Come and be unified together in prayer. We do this corporately as a church. This is part of the reason we have one another. This is part of the reason Christ gave us to one another. To stand. We are his army standing against the present darkness. We speak God's word. We should be immersed in his word. We should be, we should be working together to bring light into darkness. Ephesians 6.13, he says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. 14 through 18, he goes on. <clears throat> stand therefore. Having fastened the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your Feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times with the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, that to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. You see, he's talked in a general way about putting on the armor. Now he's just going to say, this is what it is. This is what it looks like. And so in Paul's mind, he kind of envisions this, I believe he envisions just this Roman centurion. He's chained to one. He's probably looking at the guy and he's thinking, hey, this is a lot like the armor that we see in the Old Testament, that God has, the Messiah has spiritual armor as well. Look at this. The belt of truth. Look at Isaiah 11.5. Isaiah 11.5. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. God has righteous armor as well. We reflect that. He says, we put on the belt of truth. We live in the truth of the gospel. That Jesus Christ came to save sinners and to redeem a people back for himself. And that he is going to make all things right. And that Christ brings new life. We put the truth on because it holds all of life together. When the soldiers would put on their cloak and they put on all the undergarments and that, and they, they'd cinch them up. And then they put on this belt and it holds it all in place. The gospel holds our spiritual life in place. We don't walk around without the belt. We, we put it on. Just as Messiah has his belt. Next is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate, it covered the chest and all the vital organs. And so we have this breastplate. Isaiah 59, 17. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Again, 
we are reflecting the Messiah's armor. The armor that Jesus himself wore, the spiritual armor that he wore, we put it on too. I mean, Jesus isn't just a great example for us, but he says the same armor I had on, the Son of Man, the spiritual armor I walked in, you put it on. And you walk in it. And the breastplate, it covers us. And now it's not a righteousness. This breastplate, I do not believe it's the righteousness that's imputed to us. I don't think he's talking about that righteousness. We have that righteousness the moment we believe. When Christ takes our sin, he gives us his righteousness. And we are forgiven. We are in right standing with God. That righteousness, we are robed in it. We never lose it. I think the righteousness here he's talking about is this righteousness of living. This righteousness, this practical, day-to-day, right-living righteousness. We put on the righteous qualities of Christ, and we show them forth, and it protects our lives. When you're walking in these ways, you're not walking in the old ways. You are protecting your life by walking in righteousness. This breastplate guards the inner man. It doesn't give Satan a foothold. Next is the gospel shoes. So he says here, Take up the whole armor of God that you be able to withstand the evil day, having it all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, fasten on the belt of truth, having put the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Soldiers had particular footwear. And you know what? We have particular footwear. Anybody have to go buy shoes for their kids lately? Oh my goodness, you get to the store and there's like so many different kinds of shoes for so many different... I'm sure it was like that when I was growing up. I don't remember it being like that. I remember going to the, shoes to get, to the store to get shoes. You know, it was, like, it was like, Mom, I need shoes. Okay, we go and we got tennis shoes, you know. Mom was playing baseball. Okay, we got cleats. You know, whatever. It's like, it just seemed like that was kind of... You go to the store now, it's like you have tennis shoes, running shoes, hiking shoes, cross running shoes, baseball shoes, football, cleats, lacrosse, any sport, they have their own shoe. I mean, you go on and on, then you have all your dress shoes and flip-flops. and It's exhausting. It's like, you just get... You know, we got shoe warehouses. This is crazy. Shoes were very specific. And Paul's thinking about the Roman centurion's boot. And how specific it was. And what it was used for. It had a function. It had a purpose. These soldiers wore these shoes so they could get all over the empire. They had these studded half boots. So on the, on the bottom of it were these studs that gave them great traction. So they could go over any terrain. And enabled them to travel great distances in a short amount of time. And they were able to cover all kinds of ground, pursuing their enemies into every nook and cranny. And they could go into the hard places. Didn't matter where the enemy was hiding. They could get there. They were equipped. They had the right shoes to get there. Listen, we put on the gospel. These gospel shoes. A readiness to speak about salvation and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Always shoes with the gospel being ready, being able to take it to every nook and cranny in the world, to the hard places. We need to be ready to go with the gospel anywhere God sends us, even the hard places, and proclaim Christ. He says we should be wearing these gospel shoes. Next is the shield of faith. Look at Psalm 1830. It says, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. In the Old Testament, it wasn't uncommon to speak this way about God. He is a shield. He is a fortress about me. He is a mighty bulwark. So God is our shield. In this sense, he's thinking about this long shield that the Romans carry. Now, there is a small shield. There's a shield for hand-to-hand combat in close quarters where it was usually a circle, you know, and they could could use it to to, to hit and and use their sword and everything and fight with it. it. It gave them great mobility. But the shield I think Paul is talking about here is what we envision as the, the broad shield, the big shield. 
And if you've seen any of these movies with these gladiators and with the Roman centurions and all this kind of stuff, these guys have these shields that cover their whole body from head to foot. They can get behind it. It doesn't matter what comes at them. They have this complete protection. And they can actually stand side by side and lock shields together and make like a moving fortress. Have you ever seen those things? It's It's amazing. And Paul's thinking about this, that the Roman centurion has this shield that is able to cover him and extinguish all the flaming darts that may come his way. He's protected behind that. He says, and we, like Christians, we take up the shield of faith. The shield of faith is believing the promises of God, believing them to be true, amen and yes, in Jesus, all of them that he has given them to us, and we take them up. And when the the devil shoots his fiery darts, those doubts and those accusations and anything he comes at us, the promises of God, the faith that we have in Christ extinguishes all the darts. See, Paul doesn't say you'll extinguish most of them or some of them. He says you'll be able to extinguish all of them. That every lofty accusation and thought and lie that is held up against the truth of God will be brought down. And the shield of faith will block it, will extinguish it, will protect your life. And so when the devil comes, you just come back with the promises of God. Think about Christ in the wilderness for just one moment. He's in the wilderness and Satan says, well, if you're the son of God, make bread. Feed yourself. He says, it is written. Next, when he puts him on the pinnacle, he says, throw yourself down. It's written that you won't hurt yourself. He says, it is written not to test God. Third one, he says, look at all the kingdoms. If you just worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms. Jesus says, it is written. He goes back to the written word himself. The son of man, the son of God, goes back to the word and says, it is written three times to the devil. And this is a shield about him. There was no accusation. There was no temptation. There was nothing that Satan could bring to him that could not be extinguished. Christian, we have the same shield. We take that shield and we are protected from his schemes. Lastly is this helmet of salvation. Isaiah 59, 17 again. You have that one. He says, "He he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. The helmet of salvation on his head. We need to be assured of our salvation. We need to be assured of the promise that comes through the cross, that that we are his and he is ours and that we have forgiveness. It is done. All of our sin debt has been paid at the cross. Jesus has made it sure. And we have this protection over our mind. And so Paul says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by putting on that helmet of salvation. Be transformed. So whatever happens in any circumstance, you have all that you need to overcome in that spiritual battle. In that day of darkness, you have all that you need to walk in newness of life, in fullness of life. You can be focused on God. That helmet of salvation focuses us on the hope of God of Christ, the hope and assurance that what we have in him is done, is true, that we have heaven to look forward to, a place that he is preparing for us, and that we will have him for all eternity. This relationship is restored. That hope is that, is that helmet that goes on our head. There's one more piece mentioned here. It's the sword of the Spirit. And here he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. It's offensive and defensive. In one way, when Satan comes, we can defend against him with the Word of God. But it's also offensive because we can attack. We are able to push back the darkness with the Word of God. We speak the gospel, and God uses that with the power of his Holy Spirit, and he transforms lives. I mean, think about your life. Someone spoke the Bible to you. They spoke the words of God to you. They said these things are true about Jesus and about his death on the cross, and they 
told you scripture and something in your heart burned when you heard those scriptures. Something in you just came alive and you're like, I don't know what it is. It's like you didn't say anything really supernatural, but yet it was. And it, it, it did this great transformation in me. That's what the word of God does. When it goes forth, when we bring forth the word of God, it comes with transformation. It comes with supernatural power. And he says, so take the sword of the Spirit, this offensive and defensive weapon. You can fend off Satan and his attack, and you can press back the darkness with it. He will not overcome it. We can engage with the Word of God, which means we need to know the Word of God. It means we, we need to have it. We need to study it. We need to meditate on it. We need to know what God says to us. There's, a, there's a, a lot of times where you go into museums and you see the weapons of antiquity. You ever do that? You ever like go in museums and you get to see all the different weapons from all the different battles from past and you look at them and it's kind of neat and, and, you, and you're like, but you know, nobody would use those today. Nobody would use those weapons today because man, they would just get destroyed if they tried to use those weapons. I'm like, they just, they, they're not effective for the battle but they're really cool to display. You know, it's like, yeah, if you had one of those, yeah, I'd display it. I'd put it out and be like, look at this, you know. I'm afraid that too many Christians treat the Bible the same way. They look at it and they say, this is a book of antiquity. You know, it's, it's good. It's got some good truths in it. It tells us how to live our life in some good ways here and there. But you know what? It's really, I'll just put it on display. Maybe I got the big family Bible. I'll just put it out on that coffee table. You know, it's like, look at that. That's the Bible. We don't use it because it's not effective for today. That's hogwash. I tell you what, Paul says this word is effective for all times. He says, we don't put it on display, we use it. This is the weapon that God has given to us to use. And so we take up the sword, we take up the word of God, and we become proficient with it, and we use it skillfully, Ephesians 6, 18 through 20, he ends this way. He says, Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer, supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. He says, we pray. We pray on the armor. We pray in the Spirit to put on the armor. We pray in the power of the Spirit. And we pray for the saints, not to the saints, but for the saints. So all who have become followers of Christ Jesus are a saint. That's how the Bible speaks of it. You've been redeemed. You're a saint. You're righteous and set apart and holy. That's how the Bible speaks. And he says, so we pray for all the saints, for all the believers, that they will be able to stand. And you know what? In our local community, we stand together. We pray for one another, and we take that stand. And that we, like Paul, will be able to open our mouth boldly, sharing the truth of the gospel. The last section of Scripture here, in Ephesians 21 through 24, he gives his greetings and he closes. And and he says to them that Titius has, has come to encourage them. Titius probably brought the letter to Ephesus. He also probably took the letter to Colossae, to, Colossae, to, to the, those there. And he says, you know, his role is here to tell you how we're doing and to encourage you. Your role, my role at times is to encourage one another, to go and give, give a good word, to encourage one another, to let them know that you're not doing the battle alone. That there's others who are standing, standing firm and pressing in. We stand firm. We press in. Paul ends the same way. He says that may grace be given to those. And I love the way he ends. He says, peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all 
who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Christian, we're, we're going to close with the Lord's Supper. Is your love incorruptible for Jesus? Do you love him in such a way that you treasure him and value above all things, that he is the one you look to? So when Christ gives us this armor to stand, take it. Pray on the armor of God. Ask God to cover you so that you may stand against sin and the flesh and Satan. And love Jesus for what he's done. The forgiveness of our sins found at the cross. Paul says that what was given to him is what he has proclaimed. That Christ died for sins. And that he was buried. And that on the third day he rose again. As scripture foretold. All of this was foretold before Jesus ever was born. And he made all things new through his sacrifice at the cross. So in the moment when we sing, we come to the Lord's table proclaiming salvation in our great God, Jesus. We come with thanksgiving. And I pray that we come with purity of heart. So before you come, a few things. This is for the Lord's church. This is for those who said, Jesus is my Jesus. He has saved me. I have proclaimed him, and I have found forgiveness of my sins in him. And he is mine, and I am his. This is a proclamation that you have the gospel in your life. So if that's not you, stand and sing with us, but I ask that you don't partake. This is for us to come in a worthy manner, remembering what Jesus has done for us. So church, as you prepare to come, pray if there's anything that God would have you have removed from your life, that you would remove it, you repent of it, that you would come with a pure heart, that you wouldn't make a mockery of his death at the cross by living in sin and coming and taking the table and thanking him for salvation and yet still living apart from him. No, come with a pure heart. Honor the Lord's table. Let us proclaim the greatness of Christ together. And let's thank God in prayer for this letter to Ephesians and the grace that comes through Jesus. Thank you for listening. To find out more about the Bridge Bible Church or listen to previous podcasts, please visit thebridgewire.com. Thank you.